I think it's. I, can, can you hear me? This is Aileen. Oh, good. And uh, and I'm with Biota Maxima, used to be Pacific Biodiversity Institute. I'm doing mostly recording of Harbor Porpoise, and a lot of the work I'm doing is up in Canada. Right now, it's on Salt Spring Island. Fantastic. Thanks, Celine. Um, I think Laura Cohen has been part of a meeting, but let me just double check that that's true. Yeah, hi, this is Laura. I work with Lynn Berry at NOAA Protected Resources. Great. And um, last one, I think, is Hannah or Hannah Miller. Miller, I think you've been part of a meeting too, but you know, I have COVID brain, so help me out, make sure. Hi, yes, I have. This is Hannah Miller. Also Hannah Miller, though. Either one is fine. Thanks, um, and I'm also part of Lynn Berry's team at NOAA. All right, I'm getting back to speed. Thank you. Um, and Tara, I think you've been part of our meeting, but I might as well give you a chance to d double check me on that. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I've sort of been just listening in, um, not a super active participant yet. I am Tara Galeska, and I am the Orca Recovery Coordinator for the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office, which is part of the Washington Recreation and Conservation Office, uh, tasked with um, implementing the ORCA Task Force recommendations across all of the threat areas. Nice to see folks. Thank you. I think that's, I think that's everybody, Gretchen. Great, excellent. Thanks, Scott. And thanks everybody for um, those new faces taking just a moment to introduce yourself. Welcome, we're excited to have you. So with that, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the agenda and then quickly turn it over to Scott for that first agenda item. So our first agenda item is around announcements. Um, just hearing from a few folks, including Scott, on any pertinent information on events, funding opportunities. So Scott will walk through a few of those and then open it up uh, to see if there are any other events and or uh, funding opportunities that uh, he didn't capture that this group should know about. Then we've got a series of lightning talks that we're calling them. Uh, we've got about five minutes per person, several updates on the important research that you all are involved in. And so getting updates from some key folks on this call on those updates. And, and then Scott had also asked if you weren't presenting and doing a lightning talk on your research and, and updates there. If you had a paragraph that you wanted to just put in the chat when we get to that agenda item, I'll be prompting you all to do that. But that's an additional way to provide updates to this group on all of the latest happenings in your space. And we've got about five minutes per lightning talk. Uh, we will also be handing over screen sharing controls uh, if you do have a PowerPoint um, and we'll be kind of walking through in the order that is in the agenda as well. Then turning it over to Corey and Mila on vital sign updates. We've got a few updates there and a couple of discussion questions. Nicole will be leading us through a short uh, visioning exercise, taking a look back at the 2022 work plan that you all did. Uh, what moved forward? What is the status update on each of the things that you all captured in that document? What uh, should move forward into 2023? and a couple of other key discussion questions there. And then Nicole will be wrapping us up with next steps and what happens from here? What are some upcoming meetings and opportunities for this group to convene again in the new year? Any questions and or suggestions related to the agenda before I turn it over to Scott for that first item? Not seeing anything in the chat. And not seeing any hand raises. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Scott, uh, to, kick, to kick off the announcements. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, and let me just interject that um, I am already overjoyed to have coordinators. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with PSIMP, um, many work groups have had coordinators for a long time, but it's a function of funding. And um, I think the pendulum is slowly swinging back, both federally and in terms of state funding. So. Um, congratulations, uh, Gretchen and Nicole and Corey to, for winning this contract, and I am very hopeful that it will continue to um, allow you to help me. And um, I'll just briefly say that um, you know, there's, there's lots of roles within PSIMP for those of you who haven't been part of our, our meeting before. 
Um, I just linked to a spreadsheet that shows that we have committees that focus in on particular species and topics like acoustics. And so there's lots of leadership opportunities. Um, I am excited to work with the coordinators um, and serve for up to five years more. I've, this spring, it'll be five years for me since taking over from Jerry. Um, but I'd like it to be two. So for those of you who'd like to be more involved, I would welcome volunteers for uh, co-chairing or vice chairing. And now is a great time to, to do that because I'm orienting um, this wonderful coordination team. So if you're interested in learning more about how to run the work group and interact with the PSAMP steering committee with our liaison Dave and other support from folks like Todd Haas at the partnership, please let me know. And I will give you one of these hats, my, my daughter's flock boss hats, if you help me out. Um, that said, I, we're going to have a faster pace thanks to the coordinators than our typical meeting. So I'm going to very quickly really just point to these um, bullet points. Um, recent events, the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference and the BC Marine Mammal Symposium happened this year. Uh, the archive for the Salish Sea Talks will be available in February, I learned. Um, the session that Val ran um, about community science and innovation is available on YouTube. There's a link to that. And um, there's also a YouTube archive for the BC Marine Mammal Symposium if you missed it. Um, I know that some folks probably made it to the ACS meeting. Um, if you have other events that you think folks should know about, feel free to add them here. Um, and I'll just mention, hopefully, John, you can touch on this, but two things caught my ear in the Marine Mammal Symposium. Um, about the PCFG being in, endangered or listed as endangered as a seasonal subset. So I'm hoping you could um, let us know if that actually has happened, John. And then uh, I also was surprised to hear that there were DFO effort surveys from Vancouver to Swiftsure um, over the last couple of years. I was just wasn't aware of that. Um, upcoming events on my radar are the Pulse uh, just announced early registration for a couple of interesting talks that may be of interest to this group. Um, and there's more in the fall. Uh, and then the Ways of the Whales, there's a placeholder date for it, um, if you'd like to uh, keep that available. So again, please please add other events if I've missed them. Um, and then lastly, I'm, I'm not gonna walk through these, but um, Jamie Selleck from the Forage Fish Work Group did a nice job of summarizing these um, in this box note. But there are another set of biennial funding opportunities coming next year. Um, we'll learn more about them generally at the beginning of 2023, but I've shared Jamie's notes on ones that uh, these first two were likely be related to our, our work. This one, I'm not sure, but if we're making stronger connections with Salmonid, it's possible. Salmonid, the Salmonid work group, it's possible. So yeah, that's my quick overview uh, in terms of announcements. Excellent, Scott. Thank you so much for walking through these. Any questions for Scott about any of these and or anything that you want to highlight that, that Scott didn't capture here? John, it looks like you unmuted. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, um, um, maybe just understanding with multiple coordinators from Cascadia and Scott continuing his role and maybe even a a vice or co-chair, the division of the responsibilities of who's doing what uh, uh, maybe isn't as quite clear to me, might, might be helpful to have that. And I'll just point out, many of you may know my affiliation with Cascadia Research, uh, just that Cascadia Consulting is not at all affiliated uh, with Cascadia Research. Just so. Uh, uh, so I don't have the inside knowledge of how that might work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I appreciate that question, uh, John. And yes, absolutely. John is an expert in the in the research space. We are process experts. Um, so that's a really very good distinction there. And um, for the Cascadia side of things and and working with Corey, uh, thought that that redundancy here was was good, but also we've got really clear roles and, and path forward. So Cascadia is really leading the charge on working with Scott to to coordinate uh, these meetings. 
And then Corey, the agenda item that she'll be leading uh, is, is really the, the space that, that she'll, and she'll speak a little bit more to that role and what's next on the vital signs um, element. Uh, so, so those are really kind of the two, how we're dividing and conquering uh, within the consulting team. And then Scott obviously brings years of, of experience and wanting to, to lean on that and make sure that we're starting off in a meaningful place and building off of what has really worked well for this group in the past and learning from him in terms of some of the things that um, may not wanna be repeated that you guys have tried in the past. And so that's how we're, we're coordinating with Scott. Does that answer your question, Jeff, John, in terms of how we're dividing and conquering? Well, maybe not completely, but maybe we'll push on and I don't want to belabor the point and uh, uh, maybe I'll just look to have a little chat with Scott too at some point and just uh, when there's a little more time, understand it a little better. Okay, that sounds yeah, great. I might just yeah. interject, Gretchen. Yeah, um, Scott, great. I see a hand raised, um, but I'll, I'll just say that I'm excited personally to be able to step back a little bit and not worry about logistics and both do some more research and integrative thinking about the Sailor Sea ecosystem, John, and and the you know the strategic plan for the steering committee talks about interwork group collaboration. So that's part of what I'm hoping to be able to focus a bit more on is trying to make stronger connections with forage fish and the salmonid work group, the modeling work group, and the spatial um, analysis work group. Um, moving you know towards you know ensuring that we we deliver everything that we've always done for Southern resident killer whales, but also continue to expand our, our scope and our understanding um, even beyond the vital signs, which are part of what um, you know, Gretchen and Nicole and Corey will be helping support. Um, so, so that's one idea. The other thing that I think is important in the strategic plan is, is communication generally, like doing a better job of sharing what we produce um, and designing what we produce to be shared is something that I'd like to continue working on. Um, so that's a few thoughts from me. I, I, we should make sure we, I think somebody's hand was raised. <laughs> I had my hand raised. This is Natalie. Hi, Scott. I am I work at the partnership. I lead our environmental indicators program that's called the Vital Signs. And I work closely with Katrina Radak and Jenna Judge, who are sort of the support staff overall for the, the umbrella that is PSAMP. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe a little peripheral to this, but I just want to chime in to say how excited we are that we can provide this, um, this team to, to not only coordinate the work of the work group, but really support the work group. And there's, there's a number of projects that we're thinking about that would, um, that the team is gonna help us with, and that might be part of the visioning that uh, Nicole is gonna lead a little bit later on, but see them not just as coordinators, but really providing the work group with um, a lot of sort of behind the scenes support work, drafting work uh, in the case of the vital signs. And um, there's some work uh, with Tara too that we have in mind. So like there, there's, a, there's a lot that we, we want to be able to do with you all that the coordination and support team is 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 going to uh, really help with. So we really appreciate everyone here and being able to convene everyone to to share and um, build just a, a really you know continue to build a really great work group and product do productive work together. So just wanted to put a plug for that and. Uh, I also wanted to add something about the funding opportunities, Scott, if I may. Yeah. Um, you showed, and Gretchen, uh, Scott showed three funding opportunities there at the end um, of his, yeah. So those three under number seven, those are all coming from the Par Puget Sound Partnership, so my agency, and they will be coming out sort of staggered with the next one coming out in December is C, Puget Sound salmon science investigations. And, um, you know, there, there might be some ties there to marine mammal uh, world. So I, I would encourage you to look at those. And for folks, it might be a little tricky to understand the difference between these. There are differences, 
Um, and if the information that's provided there uh, on our website is not enough, please, please feel free to reach out to, to me or others that are listed. Like um, it might, you know, we see differences. Uh, the second one here, monitoring to accelerate recovery um, is the one that I'm involved closely with. Um, you know, there, there's, there are some differences here with maybe some overlap. So if you, if you have some questions, please let us know. We will have opportunities. There will be an informational webinar and also a Q&A question period once the solicitation comes out. And you can find the solicitation announcement on the partnerships website, but you, we will be sure to circulate it amongst all of the work groups because the B1 especially is targeting the monitoring community in this region. So for sure, you guys will, will get that, but we're all in coordination. So you'll get information about all three of them. We're really excited. Please do take a look at them. Um, we'd love to see your proposals. Excellent. Really appreciate you adding that additional context, Natalie, both on the, the structure of support as well as on these upcoming funding opportunities. Any other, either we're going to move on here in just a minute to the, these lightning talks, um, but any other events and or funding opportunities that weren't captured that you want to be share, sure to share with this group before we move on to the next agenda item? Feel free to put things in the chat. You'll notice Scott's putting some links to some of the, the documents um, in the chat as we go along as well. Anything else not captured on the upcoming events and our funding opportunity side of things? Not seeing any hands up, I think in the chat. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item here, which is general updates. And so getting to hear from all of, from many of you on project monitoring, results, activities, publications, any and all things. Uh, and in the agenda that was circulated, there's a list and that's the order that will go in. And we've got five minutes per lightning talk. I'm really excited to hear from each of you. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, before we dove into walking through the agenda, uh, if you aren't giving a talk, but you prepared a paragraph about your work over the last few months that you want to share with this group, feel free to put that in the chat. And I'll just pause for a moment here to see if anything comes through in the chat. What we'll be doing with this chat, we're not going to read through it right now, but we'll be putting it into the meeting notes and circulating these um, updates, these chat updates uh, in the meeting notes as well. So pause here for a minute just to see if anybody's got anything they're putting into the chat. Give you a moment to do that. And well, we've got, oh yeah, go ahead, Scott. I was just gonna say, Gretchen, while we're waiting, um, I, I'm not sure there may be a couple of new folks who've, who've joined. Um, would you like to give them a quick chance to introduce themselves? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. So I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but Jess Stocking, I'm, I, I think, I can't remember if you've been part of a work group meeting before, but I wanted to welcome you and give you a chance to introduce yourself if you'd like. I sure have been here. Um, and today I'm looking in the background because I'm a little bit sick and my eyes are rolling back into my head, but um, <laughs> it's nice to be here and I'm happy to see familiar faces. Uh, I'm Jess Stocking. I work for WDFW. Um, I'm in the Wildlife Diversity Division, so listing and recovery actions for uh, marine mammals and marine birds and sea turtles. Um, I spend about half of my time doing Southern resident killer whale work, so nice to be here. Good, thank you for that. Um, and Gary, I, I can't also remember if you've been a part, but I wanted to give you a chance as well. Hi, everybody. Now, um, this is my first attending of the meeting. Um, Gary Heinrich with the uh, Central Puget Sound Marine Mammal Stranding Network. I'm the um, response coordinator for them. And uh, happy to be here and listen in what's going on. Great. Thank you for joining us. And I'm looking forward to more information about elephant seals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not enough. <laughs> Great. Is that everybody, Scott? Yeah, I think so. OK, perfect. And just noticing, Tara, thank you so much uh, for putting something in the chat, a link to a publication. And then we've also got something um, from Francis in here as well. So thanks for adding that and a link um, to some work. 
And with that, we are going to turn it over to you, John, for the humpback whale photo ID work. And got uh, five minutes. So we'll turn it. We've got six talks. John, take it away. Okay, that sounds great. And, uh, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, I think I've got two five minute slots for gray whale and humpback whales. I'll be showing quite a few slides, so I'll be going quickly through them. Um, I was going to start with gray whales, uh, just featuring a little bit. This will be very Cascadia research centric. Um, and uh, we've been doing work on a number of elements, including the, this is uh, uh, the kind of title slide of a presentation I did for the Marine Mammal Conference uh, earlier this year. Uh, but uh, part of what I do want to talk about is um, both the overall gray whale population and some of the work on strandings. Uh, uh, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, the group that stays in the Pacific Northwest and feeds through spring, summer, and fall, and then the sounders that uh, use the inside waters of northern Puget Sound. And I'm going to just touch on some of our ongoing work with each of those quickly. Uh, first of all, the overall population is in the midst of an unusual mortality event. Uh, a number of the people on the working group here are part of the stranding network, so are part of this, but uh, this is just some summary slides where basically the current unusual mortality event was declared in 2019, uh, but is still active currently. You can see this involves mortality of gray whales up and down their full range from Mexico to Alaska, but you can see quite a cluster of mortalities in Washington state. And that's what Cascadia uh, research we've been focused on is documenting the long-term trends of uh, strandings in Washington state. And this is going back to the 70s, the annual number of gray whale strandings. Uh, we uh, uh, were aware from both our responses and others, you can see some major peaks in when these occur. Uh, and I've circled these here, and I'm gonna come back to these and show you some of our kind of some of the links we've been making with those. The, uh, this right circle is the most recent unusual mortality event. Uh, and one interesting thing is that our mortalities in Washington State link well with the overall trends in gray whale abundance. This is taken from the work Southwest Fisheries Science Center does. And superimposing that gray whale strandings uh, with the gray whale abundance, you'll see three periods where the population declined you know, and that's this line, gray line you see behind. And you can see these three periods exactly match up with those areas of high strandings that we documented in Washington State uh, here. Two of them were declared UMEs. Uh, I will point out that the unusual mortality event did not seem to affect the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. This is the group that feeds in the Pacific Northwest. It numbers about 200 to 250 animals, a collaborative program between Cascadia Research uh, uh, and the Marine Mammal Lab uh, and other collaborators has been documenting the abundance of these animals. And that's what this graph is from. We do this with mark recapture abundance estimates. Um, this uh, to zero in on the sounders gray whales. You can see I'm trying to go fast here. Uh, um, these are those uh, regular whales that return every spring to feed uh, in the Whidbey Island area. Each row here is a different individual. Columns are years. Where it's highlighted, it means we saw that individual. And you can see we've been, uh, there were about six whales that we initially documented in the early 1990s. Those whales have continued to be seen now for over 30 years, though we finally do have a little bit of attrition. Uh, one whale, 49, or what we call patch, did disappear in 2021. And another whale, uh, Dubnocker 44, was in really bad condition this year and we think may have dropped off. But what's also clear is that we had another six whales that joined this group in 1999, 2000. And then we've had a bunch of recent animals joining these sounders groups in more recent years. Now, those three periods may sound familiar if I superimpose with gray bars. Uh, those new sounders whales on our annual stranding graph again that I keep coming back to. You'll see these periods where new sounders joined exactly line up with our three main mortality periods uh, for Washington strandings. And what it basically says that we think it's uh, 
those, un, those mortality events in the overall population is what drove some of these whales to seek out and find new alternate feeding areas, uh, such as what the sounders have done in northern Puget Sound. Uh, we also find a significant regression between what we call stragglers, gray whales that show up in unusual areas. That also correlates with the mortalities each year. So that's by lightning. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so, well, a couple of more things on gray whales. Sorry, before I jump to humpback whales. We are continuing our health assessment work with John Durbin and Holly Fernball. Um, and this measures body condition of especially the sounders gray whales using length to basically uh, width or girth measurements as shown here, something they've been doing with killer whales. Uh, and we've been applying it to gray whales since 2020. We've documented how these sounders gray whales, each of these lines is a different sounder gray whale showing improved body condition over the period in spring where they feed. Um, and this is for, in this case, 2020 and 2021, each line representing a different individual where we were able to get multiple uh, kind of body condition measurements, if you will. Uh, we do have quite a bit of work continuing with the sounders and in fact, expanding uh, the continuing monitoring of these individual whales, the health assessment, uh, we're excited to have Hannah uh, Clayton uh, got accepted to Stanford's Goldbogen Lab, and we'll be working on the sounders with us intensely the next four years, particularly doing energetics um, and feeding calculations with them. We'll be doing some continued deployments of suction cup attached archival tags uh, to look at uh, changes in their feeding. Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to officially uh, announce it yet, but I think we will be receiving some funding through the National Estuarine Program uh, that the Puget Sound Partnership is a, a part of that will uh, help support some of this documentation of these increased numbers of gray whales and also humpback whales, uh, you know, in, in the Puget Sound estuarine area. Okay, with that, I did want to transition. I think I was about five minutes, so... I think I'm staying close to my time here. Uh, uh, just to mention that we also have ongoing research projects with humpback whales. Uh, uh, our work here in Washington is part of a larger program along the whole US West Coast. It has a number of collaborators that are involved in this. It's been largely supported by NOAA, uh, but we've been working closely with WDFNW uh, as well as other groups. Uh, you know, these involve small boat surveys and sometimes coordination with NOAA's ship surveys up and down the coast, but we mostly do photo ID of individual animals. Uh, we use those photo IDs to estimate the abundance of humpback whales with marker capture equations. For example, this is our estimate of the abundance of humpback whales in California and Oregon uh, going through 2021. Uh, from the late 1980s, showing about an 8% per year increase. These are multiple models uh, that, again, show this increase. For specifically Washington and Southern British Columbia, we have also seen this very, you know, substantial increase in numbers of animals. Uh, this is, you know, we primarily studied these animals off the Washington and BC coast, but grabbing a slide from Hannah Miller, who's also on the call from her master's thesis, uh, and drawing from some of the data from the Whale Museum, Orca Network, and calls to us, this is the number of sighting reports uh, inside of the Salish Sea that have come in over the years. And you can see this fairly explosive use of humpback whales inside of the inside waters as these animals have expanded back into areas they've used. Uh, one of the things we're concerned with as that has happened, it has brought, you know, uh, as populations of humpbacks have increased, uh, so have the number of reported entanglements. Uh, and this is for the whole US West Coast. NOAA data showing, especially starting around 2015, a big uptick in the number of whale entanglements along the West Coast heavily driven by an increase in humpback whales and particularly in the Dungeness crab commercial fishery. Uh, we've been doing a bunch of projects related to that, some of them centered in California. Uh, I'm gonna jump over a few of these, but some of these are to help inform the uh, California Dungeness crab working group. 
uh, and some of our work and work by uh, others has uh, resulted in the delayed opening of that fishery in years where there seem to be high concentrations of whales still present when the fishery usually opens, which typically is in mid-November uh, for California. Um, and uh, that recently was delayed now into December for California. Both Oregon and Washington also have working groups and both states are, all three states are working on conservation plans for humpback whales that we're trying to help inform with our work. Uh, we do track some of the entangled whales and look at survival of both whales that become entangled and are freed. And just uh, to say we've shown kind of higher mortality of those whales and uh, lower reciting rates of them after the fact. We're also working with several graduate students on scar studies, looking at entanglement scars and what they tell us about trends and distribution of these entanglements. Uh, we are excited that especially in cooperation with Happy Whale, uh, this complicated slide, but I'll just point you to uh, looking at where these Salish, the humpbacks that are seen inside the Salish Sea, which so far 755 different humpback whales have been identified inside the Salish Sea out of the uh, almost over 1600 different unique individuals identified for all of Washington and Southern British Columbia. So almost half of them have been seen inside the Salish Sea. Uh, we know the migratory destination of what breeding ground, which matters for their ESA status uh, of 53% uh, of those animals, which is great. That's over 53%. And just to point another number, if we apply some selection criteria, animals that have been seen over a 10 year period, we actually know the migratory destination of 78% of those whales. And it basically shows it includes Mexico, large proportions of animals kind of almost somewhat equally split between Mexico and Hawaii and a small proportion going to Central America. Uh, our project with DFO has uh, looked at ship strike risk and in particular with Department of Fisheries Oceans, we're in our third year of having deployed archival tags on humpback whales, especially in the straits. These are actually the tracks of tagged humpback whales using GPS positions from the tags and how they overlap with the shipping lanes. I won't go into much detail on that because I think I'm at the end of my 10 minutes. <laughs> that was almost like clockwork, John. That was like perfectly timed. <laughs> exactly 10 minutes there. Appreciate that. Okay. And we did get a question from Scott in the chat. You can feel free to answer it in the chat or you can answer it during kind of the designated Q&A um, time as well. So thank you so much for that, John. All right. for the presentation. And we're gonna head over to Jason for the Salish Sea Acoustic Monitoring. Share my screen appropriately. Okay, I'm getting an, okay, is that, everybody see the, the presentation screen there? Yeah, we got it. Awesome, thanks. So I was uh, asked to just give an update in terms of the, the Spruce Consulting uh, acoustic monitoring that's happened in the Salish Sea in, in this past year. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. All right. So uh, in terms of, um, yeah, these are the, the locations we've been monitoring in in the last, uh, in, in this past uh, 12 months. Um, I guess I'll start sort of working from, uh, I don't know what, it's roughly north to south, but not really. Uh, so the red dot at the top there uh, is uh, Broad Inlet. We've been monitoring there at up to five locations since uh, 2019. Uh, in support of the ECHO program of the the, the Port of Vancouver, um, and uh, and we'll be continuing that that project onwards. It's uh, those are archival hydrophones uh, that are situated up there for the most part. Although we've been doing some uh, uh, source level measurements um, as well, um, and and I guess the the, the highlight uh, for the work up there at the moment is 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 one that it's always nice in terms of long term acoustic monitoring is that. You know, we're, we're not only just finding sort of new sources of anthropogenic noise, but we're also finding, um, you know, surprises in terms of biology and stuff. And so I'm uh, happy to say that last uh, February, uh, we had acoustic detections, some very nice quality acoustic detections of northern residents uh, in Burrard Inlet. In fact, all the way into Indian Arm, uh, way in the back of, of Burrard Inlet. Um, so super exciting to, to, uh, to get to um, detect them uh, back there. 
Um, in terms of uh, moving on to some of our other uh, locations, so uh, we've been deploying some of our acoustic buoys in, in, in a number of different locations, specifically for uh, Fishers and Oceans Canada. Uh, we've been uh, monitoring, uh, not this winter, but last winter uh, and spring uh, at uh, um, Point Roberts. That was one of the dots there. And then, uh, and then this past summer uh, for three months out at uh, Carmena Point Lighthouse out at the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the, what the buoys are like. They've got a, a lander on the bottom with the instrumentation and batteries, uh, uh, three hydrophone arms that are spaced uh, two meters apart, and then um, a data cable and communications buoy um, at the surface. Uh, this just shows you the, the deployments at, at both uh, Point Roberts and uh, Carmena Point. Uh, one of the things that we do with, um, with the three hydrophones is calculate bearings. Uh, to the detected calls. So the, the, the buoys themselves run basically their Linux processors that are running uh, PAMGuard uh, or a variant of PAMGuard uh, in real time. So it's edge processing that, that uh, does the detections. And then in this case also calculates uh, bearings. And so in this uh, pass by, if you will, uh, you can see the detections of, of Southern residents uh, in June uh, on the 21st of uh, this past summer. Uh, moving sort of from south to southwest past the uh, the Carmana Point um, lighthouse, um, and and so these the, this partic that particular system was set up on a on cell phones. So it was actually beaming uh, detections back um, from Carmana Point to uh, the Nia Bay, basically the whatever cell towers were functioning at Nia Bay, and then back to our our servers. Um, so in terms of the uh, the, the anthropogenic noise sources. We did have um, one thing that I'll highlight there that we still haven't quite figured out, and, and maybe some folks have, might have some ideas on it, but on the right-hand side here, so this is a long-term spectrogram average uh, from June, uh, so it doesn't start, you know, we deployed it the 6th of June, that's why it's blank on the left. Uh, you know, most of that LTSA looks fairly uh, uh, fa fairly normal for, for this kind of habitat in the Salish Sea um, with ships passing, et cetera. Uh, but what you see on the right are some horizontal lines there, and uh, uh, that that's an unknown unknown anthropogenic noise source that has a, a, a fundamental of about five hertz with some harmonics that go all almost all the way up to about 100 hertz. That uh, increased the noise uh, floor of our system for about a month, a month and a half, and then and then disappeared. Uh, and we're still not sure what it is. I, I thought it might have been a, a marine vibrosite, sort of sort of a, a geophysical. Uh, a survey of some kind. We've found no evidence of that happening out there just now. Uh, and we're just working with DFO and scratching our heads to see if it's maybe shown up on some other systems, acoustic systems out there on the on the outer coast. Uh, moving on from, from buoy-based systems uh, to lime kiln, we've maintained uh, the, the, uh, the cable uh, hydrophone there uh, in support of uh, the ECHO program uh, with our partners at the Whale Museum. Uh, and uh, just monitoring, uh, um, yeah, in this case, uh, a vessel, the, the efficacy of vessel slowdowns. I guess the other thing I'll highlight, uh, we did squeeze it in this year, is that we've been uh, building uh, an array. We're installing an array there. And just a, a shout out to my dive buddy at the Whale Museum who's on the call, Alexis, who helped out last week with a, a bunch of dives there to start getting the infrastructure in. We're going to put in um, five hydrophones that will uh, be uh, calculating bearings to uh, uh, both calls and then uh, clicks as well for um, passing Southern residents, hopefully when they start coming back uh, in the new year. Uh, and then, then just to end off, um, one of those uh, uh, farther south points uh, is, uh, is a, a, a location that we literally, this was a picture from yesterday, we finally deployed um, the, uh, our, our acoustic system uh, uh, for the, in support of the quiet sound uh, slowdown. Uh, and this is just the uh, the frame going in. It's not a, a, a buoy-based system. It's just the frame on the bottom autonomous system that we'll recover in three months. It's got a, our primary um, uh, hydrophone with a backup hydrophone as well. Uh, and then the third instrument on on the there is uh, uh, a current a current meter. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Excellent. Thanks very much. And just uh, calling attention, uh, people's attention to the chat. Uh, there are a couple of questions for John. He responded to the questions in the chat. Uh, not seeing any uh, for you uh, at this moment. And Jason, thank you so much for that presentation. 
now moving into ropeless soundtrap deployment and hearing from Cindy. Let me unmute myself so you can actually hear me. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. I'm Cindy Ellister from Pacific Mammal Research, uh, and uh, this is in collaboration with the Sea Mammal Education Learning Technology Society, also known as SMELTS. Um, so we got a Soundtrap uh, 500 HF, so uh, allows for high frequency recording, which is what we want for harbor purposes. Um, we are putting it out in our study site in Burroughs Pass off of Anacortis, where we study harbor porpoises and harbor seals and whatever other marine mammal tends to come in there, which isn't a whole lot of other ones, but occasionally we do have orcas come through and a couple other species. Um, so we, want, we wanted a way to deploy this and what Smeltz is doing is creating ropeless fishing gear, uh, mainly focused on the East Coast, but is doing some more stuff on the West Coast as well, uh, including lobster traps and crab traps and gillnet uh, fisheries as well. Um, so the idea is to have these devices that can go out and traps that can go out without having lines in the water where entanglements can occur. So um, Smeltz is also really interested in helping researchers uh, do their work uh, and with having uh, without ropes if possible or lines. Um, so they created a, um, a unique system of, of a rig basically for our sound trap to be able to deploy it without those ropes or permanent buoys. Um, and so what happens is you dump it over the side, which is very scary when you do it, jumping or very expensive equipment over the side, as you all know. But um, <laughs> when you're ready to retrieve it, you, there's an acoustic trigger that um, causes the uh, air tank to inflate the inflatable bag and it lets it to the surface. Uh, and then you can grab it and then take the data out and then put it back in if you want. Um, so we got our, had our first deployment of this last year. Um, and then they do have, uh, Smelts is really good at integrating all these different technologies to be able to track the the, uh, boot, the, the, the gear, whether it's traps or research gear, above and below the water. Um, so there are smart, smart buoys all that allow for GPS and telemetry uh, once they come to the surface. So in case it pops up unexpectedly or whatnot, you know where it is. Um, and so this is just a picture of one of our deployments where we pulled it up. There is a line on the bottom of that but, uh, in that picture. Uh, because that was a testing one. We wanted to make sure the rig works before dumping it over and not being able to get it back uh, if it wasn't working correctly. So we do a testing one with a line on it and then remove it. Um, they are also testing this gear to actually combine with fisheries. So when they put traps out to actually have a, a recruiter reporter on the trap. So they're having fishermen be able to help with the research as well, which is really exciting. Um, and just a, a plug, they are looking for more partners to try these for research purposes like we're doing here. This is, I think they have one other one out on the East Coast that they did this with, and then ours. Um, so these are kind of the first ones that they've been trying with, uh, with researchers. Um, so if you're interested in that, please let me know. And um, they're always looking for, for more ways to look at it to uh, test the gear and get it out there. So uh, preliminary data, um, we don't have all sound, sound files uh, analyzed yet because it's a really small nonprofit and it takes a long time to go through all that. Um, and we do have a, a graduate student that is looking at um, the, using PanGuard to look for the click detection because again, we can record, if they just have the click detection technology and then it also can record their full vocalizations if they do happen to do that uh, near it and pointed at it, of course. Um, so, uh, so some of the, all the rest of this data is preliminary information from um, what we've looked at so far. Uh, the depth that we have it in our study site there in Burroughs Pass is about 100 feet. Um, the unit did drift a bit because the currents do rush through there quite uh, strongly, um, but it, it didn't, it, I don't know exactly how far it was, but it was probably in a couple, um, maybe 10 or 20 meters or 30 meters. Um, so it was still within the area, but it did drift a little bit. So that was, um, so that is, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll get you more in just a minute. Sorry, my two and a half year old is over on the couch. <laughs> um, so the average background sound pressure level we found is about 42 decibels. Um, so this is a, 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 there's a lot of boats that go through here in the summer. And this was deployed in June and July. Um, so in the summer, we have about uh, our max boat count in 20 in two hours is about as over 80 boats. So this can be a very, very uh, high traffic area. Um, so the average boat noise was about uh, 76 decibels at peak amplitudes so at the highest level. 
Um, the highest one we found was about 94 decibels. So I was looking at some other papers and this seems a little bit lower than some other areas, which kind of makes sense because we don't have cruise ships. We don't have, except for the one weird one that comes through here. Um, we don't have uh, the ferry boats and things like that coming through this. These are mainly small, smaller vessels that are going through. Um, <clears throat> The average uh, duration of boat noise was about three minutes. Um, and to date, we unfortunately don't have any harbor corpus clicks detected, uh, but we did have orca calls uh, and a possible seal or sea lion uh, calls detected. Uh, these still have to be confirmed, but they were low frequency growl, gravelly sounds that are, might be typical of that kind of noise. We have to figure that out. Um, so I did want to do this, and I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it or not. It, the, the sounds are quite faint, but I will play it, and you can see the cursor will show up and show you where you can see on the on the diagram. This is, uh, we did pick up orca calls after the harbor porpoise was killed in our area, which is great for the orcas, but less so for us. The next ones are louder. <laughs> They're pretty faint, Cindy, but um, yeah. maybe we can share the audio file um, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're even hard to, hard to hear on. Yeah, on they my, definitely. My computer. <laughs> These ones definitely, are little, definitely look like calls. Yeah. I didn't turn it off. There it goes. Um, so anyway, it was exciting that we got those. Um, and one of the unique things is because we're out there visually, uh, observing uh, a lot of the times we can correlate when we see when we know that there's something there we can look at the you know what, what was happening in the, uh, the vocals um so we did put it out for a second time um in november, uh, this november uh, november 2nd and it's still out should be out through sometime in december um we did use a bit heavier weights to reduce any drift uh, we also put it in a different location which actually has a stronger current and uh, and some of that part of the part of the time um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works. So we're still in the in the development stage of figuring out how this how exactly this is going to work the best for this location and, and in general. So overall, we're trying to look at you know if the bottom deployment is acceptable for various analyses. So this may be that we don't ever hear harbor corpus clicks because it's on the floor and they're just not pointing that way since high frequency is more directional. Um, so we're trying to see you know what can we what kind of data can we collect with this type of deployment. Um, we want to look at the soundscape. Again, this is a very busy marine area right next to a marina. So how does this compare between seasons? And so this will allow us to look at winter and summer uh, for these two deployments. Um, and we are providing evidence that the gear can work for research purposes, uh, even in strong currents and, and different areas. So uh, we're excited to see that. Um, and then we are, of course, collecting and analyzing any harbor focus vocalizations that we get and being able to compare that with our visual observations. So if we know that they were foraging, uh, from our visual observations, we can look and see what kind of vocalizations they were doing. So um, it's very exciting. And if everybody wants to know, learn more about that, please just get in touch and we'd be happy to come connect you with Smelts and um, see what we can do together. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much for presenting, Cindy. And we're going to turn it right over to Erin. And just Cindy's note, there are a couple of questions for you in the chat if you want to head to the chat and answer those questions that are there. Erin? Thank you. That was really interesting, Cindy, and I'm definitely going to get in touch with you about uh, the sound trap deployment. <laughs> um, but oops, I went. To, so today uh, I'm going to talk about a few projects we have ongoing on se salmon, seals, and killer whales. Um, and many folks who are at this meeting have been a, played a role in some way or another with these projects, um, but for if there's anyone who's not familiar with Oceans Initiative, we are a research nonprofit based here in Seattle, um, but we work um, in the Pacific Northwest and globally on uh, marine conservation issues. So the first project um, I want to speak about today is a, a land-based study to assess the impact of licensing and vessel regulations on Southern resident killer whales. Uh, we just completed the second of a third year WDFD 
sorry, sorry, Jessica, WDFW funded contract to understand how commercial whale watching regulations um, affects boater behaviors. So we did that in year one. The focus of year two was the killer whale behavior, especially foraging. And year three will really focus on the activity of budgets, compliance, um, and we'll include an overview of what we've found. Um, we also wanted to know how do boat type, number, distance, and speed affect foraging, and what the influence of education, enforcement, and research activities on both private boater and behavior and uh, foraging activity. So these are just really, um, there's a lot of information. Um, so I'll just be quick and, and summarize um, that in 2021 and 2022 field seasons, commercial whale watching boats made up 8.2% 8 8 of vessel occurrence compared to but, um, private boaters, which were 53% and 24% research. Commercial whale watching vessels tended to be low in number uh, when they were around southern resident killer whales and followed the rules regarding uh, both approach distance and speed. And in terms of the impact on killer whales themselves, it, it looked as though many um, commercial whale watching companies chose to watch Biggs killer whales instead of southern resident killer whales when given the option. Um, and compared to 2019, we had few observations of um, commercial whale watching boats near Southern resident killer whales during the open licensing window. The um, impact may have been fully mitigated at this new approach distance and speed limit, or we may have had too few observations to measure an effect. So um, we're looking forward to collecting additional data this summer. Um, we can still detect the effect of vessel presence um, from the private boaters on Southern resident killer whale foraging behavior. And we found a um, that the evidence is really equivocal for both that sentinel and magnet effect that um, was a topic of discussion over the past few years. So when um, commercial whale watchers were present, um, boat number was higher. Um, when commercial whale watchers were present, private boaters slowed down. So that kind of indicates a sentinel effect. But next year, we hope to have um, more data, again, to test whether there's a net benefit. Um, and so I'm going to move straight into uh, the SEAL project using the targeted acoustic startle technology or TAST. Um, it was developed by our colleagues at the University of St. Andrews in partnership with Genus Wave. Um, targeted stands for the frequencies that really target harbor seals and not other species. Acoustic, of course, because it's a customizable signal. Um, and a startle technology, it's a rapid onset short signal that uh, is intended to elicit a fear response rather than um, inflict any pain. Um, and the study I want to show today is from our Capital Lake Deschutes River case study, quite near um, Cascadia Research. And um, Tara kindly joined us in the field one day to, to observe uh, what we were doing. But the objective was really to look at this non-lethal means of reducing pinniped predation on salmon um, at human built bottlenecks. Um, we're going to assess, we assess the effectiveness of tasks on reducing seal predation on the Tom Waterfalls hatchery run of Chinook salmon. So we collected observations um, of the seals and any predation events in 30 minute survey periods. The preliminary results are showing that when the, um, the task is on, predation is reduced. Um, it looks like a significant difference at this stage. Um, and it looks as though more, more Chinook salmon are, are reaching their destination. So we've carried out the task project. Alejandro's on this call. His um, graduate student um, is close to submitting a, a publication to share the results from Whatcom Creek. We've um, also carried out this work in Ballard Locks and other locations. So we're also working on synthesizing um, those results for publication. Um, the task did not work as well at Ballard Locks as in other locations. So we're really investigating uh, why that may be. And our priority for 2023 is to optimize the task signal for use on sea lions and scale up uh, wherever it's needed, whether it's for sea lions or for harbor seals. And we would welcome any suggestions for new sites where um, pinnabed predation is a problem. 
a lot of alliteration there. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. And we're looking forward to updating um, this group in 2023 about our work with PSP Noise and Marine Waters. Um, and we are available for, for any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Erin. And there are a few questions in here in the chat. Uh, and so going to be, um, feel free, Erin, to go over there. Thanks so much for your presentation. So we're going to go into the last presentation for the lightning round and turn it over to you, Giles. Hi, everybody. Uh, this says that the uh, screen sharing is dis disabled. We will try to figure that out. I think you came a little bit later, just needing to make uh, Giles a uh, co-host, and then it should work. Is that working now? Uh, it seems to be on my end. Can you guys see that? We can. Awesome. Okay, I uh, I don't have any findings. I just wanted to give a very uh, quick update on uh, what we're now calling the um, Southern Resident Killer Well Health Monitoring Program formerly called uh, University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology SCAP project. Um, so we did take the program over from Dr. Wasser in uh, right around this time last year, and it became official January 1. And um, I just wanted to very quickly um, state our mission, which is to translate science into action to save Southern resident killer wells from extinction. Um, and we do that through on the water conservation research policy engagement and strategic advocacy. And I'm going to talk about all of those later if anybody's interested. Um, I do a lot of these things with a lot of people on this call. So everybody probably knows what I'm talking about there. And I did want to mention that in our new research permit uh, uh, under Wild Orca, our, our range does go all the way down to, um, I'm sorry, I guess I'm not showing you my screen. Um, uh, does go all the way down to uh, the southern extent of the southern residence range, um, and then it also includes the information, uh, pardon me, the area up here in Canada. So uh, previously, when it was under Sam's permit, we just went out to um, actually just really right around the San Juans. Um, I just am showing this picture to show everybody our new research boat, which I'm absolutely entirely in love with. It's made by Bullfrog Boats right in Anacortes. Um, this has turned out to be just a game changer for us. We designed a wet lab on the back of the boat. Uh, this big uh, uh, barbecue looking uh, um, contraption here. And it allows us to uh, not only uh, not process uh, fecal samples leaning over the side of the boat, um, but it allows us to collect the sample and then immediately get right back on scene with the whales, which has saved a, a tremendous amount of time. Uh, and it's it's not uh, backbreaking work anymore to process the samples. Um, and just quickly, a uh, shout out to my uh, crew and volunteers and our partners. Our new uh, research lab that will be analyzing the fecal samples is the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. They are an organization that has been around since 1916, based in San Diego. Uh, they're an international not-for-profit conservation organization committed to saving species worldwide. And they'll be doing our hormone analysis, DNA analysis, um, our POPs, and um, then we'll be partnering with other folks, including still Sam to analyze the, the old samples, uh, as well as uh, uh, moving forward with some new uh, analyses that we're hoping to get into. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Giles. And just wanting to check the chat here. We did have a couple of folks that had to head over to other meetings. We've had uh, questions answered in the chat about five minutes for any questions that you haven't yet had a chance to ask in the chat based on any of these presentations from John, Jason, Cindy, Aaron, or Giles. Five minutes. I had a quick nuance with uh, to ask you, John. Um, my, my question in the chat was, was about what I thought Howie had said was a gray whale strike in November, 2021. And I, I don't even know if it was confirmed to be a gray, but it was by the fast ferry as opposed to one of the Washington State ferry strikes of humpbacks. So I, I just wondered 
before that slips completely off at least my radar screen, whether whether there are any more insights from that or whether we should flag that as I, 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 there's a lot of fast ferry development happening and I'm not sure that we're tracking all of the impacts yet. No, that's a good point. It may not be one I'm uh, particularly up on either. I don't know if uh, uh, Hannah or Lynn, uh, anyone else on the call know more specifically about that specific one with the fast ferry and the gray whale. I'll try to look into that more, uh, Scott. Uh, uh, I think I recall hearing about it. I, I, I just don't know if we had a lot of documentation uh, of that or it's just something that, uh, that we missed. We were trying to compile and my comment in the chat was aimed at the fact that uh, these ones that have involved the at least two that we presumed fatal with <clears throat> regular ferries with humpback whales, did represent really interesting cases, if you will, because we knew the speed of the vessel, uh, you know, we knew details about it occurring. It sort of demonstrated how most ship strikes go undetected. And those were probably only detected because they were, they were ferries and really populated areas with lots of people on board documenting it. And I think most of the ship strikes that occur with, especially larger cargo ships go undocumented and no one sees or reports them, but these, ones with fairies can be very instructive. Uh, Scott, Elisa here, I, I, I do recall that incident. And, and I think that it wasn't confirmed, but I was out there and there was the gray whale, there was a gray whale out there and the boat uh, self-reported bumping the gray whale. Uh, but then they, I think self-reported that it moved on, but I was out there and I never saw the whale again, but so we don't have proof that I know of um, or that it was confirmed a gray, but they they reported as a gray. There was a straggler gray floating around in that area at that time, that day. So that's that's what I know. But yeah. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. Hey. I, I wanted to this just is, oh, go ahead. Um, this is Hannah Miller with NOAA. And so I just searched through my email to see um, and there's an email from Kristen Wilkinson, who's our standing network coordinator about this. And it's kind of what everyone is saying that there was a gray whale, that the captain reported it, put the vessel in full stop, and they heard a thud, saw it surface one time, there wasn't any blood, but then they never saw it surface again. And that's where the record ends. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Time thanks. For one more question before we need to head over to the next agenda item. Remaining questions for any of the presenters? John, uh, like Scott, you need it. Scott, you had a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if I answered them both. I think one was the DFO's uh, status on PCFG gray whales, treating them as a distinct group. And uh, I do know that is something, you know, uh, DFO under their SARA Act, you know, has moved forward with, but NOAA has not you know, at this point, recognize PCFG as a distinct unit, yet though they do discuss it separately under, you know, the gray, overall gray whale stock assessment, if you will. I know that was one of your questions, but. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. Good question, Scott. I see a link in the chat to the notes about the strike um, from Scott. Just one short question for John, if you have a moment. Yeah, this is Val okay. up on San Juan Island. Hi. You know, over the last years, we've been hearing in the winter, often starting at night, what are termed non-song vocalizations of humpbacks out here in the Harrow Strait. And oddly, this year, there hasn't been a peep. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, it, it, it is a, a question that's come up in other areas too, especially down in Monterey Bay and, you know, winter, you know, uh, hearing a lot of winter song. In fact, if you use acoustic detections in areas like Monterey Bay, you'd think humpbacks were most common in winter <laughs> as compared to summer. I wonder, uh, Val, any chance any of that, uh, do any of the recordings reveal this? Because I think when humpbacks go into song, you know, one humpback whale can produce a really long string of calls. And if you measure it by days, vocalizations heard or hours, any chance that could be like 
a very small number of animals, maybe one that stayed around that year and didn't the other year? Uh, Scott's worked hard on this and has a lot more insight than I do. Um, I have no notion of how many whales are out there. I've heard such strong vocalizations in the hydrophone. I thought, well, hey, it's a beautiful day. There's no wind. I can go sit down there by the water with my binoculars and I'm going to see this. And I've never been able to see anything. And I don't have those five hydrophones that I wish I did that Jason's putting in at Lime Kiln, which will let us or let him you know, get a sense of direction to see if the calls we're hearing are coming from one angle or coming from multiple angles. So yeah, th these are huge unknowns, but, um, but this year is dramatically, I mean, there aren't, you can't even measure it in orders of magnitude. There've been zero. <laughs> I mean, one exciting uh, thing is, you know, historically humpbacks used to be present in the Salish Sea in winter. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the whaling station that was at Pages Lagoon near Nanaimo primarily was there to hunt humpback whales in winter months. So it is rather intriguing. Will we, you know, I think they wiped them out in the early 1900s. You know, will we see an increased occurrence of humpback staying and overwintering in Puget Sound as look like might have been occurring to some degree prior to that whaling station operating. Great, excellent. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for the questions. Uh, thank you for responding to some of the questions in the chat and thank you all so much for the presentations. Uh, a couple more things in the chat, a uh, few more updates that people have shared. And uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Corey to kick off our next agenda item, which is the vital signs update. Yeah, thank you, Gretchen. Uh, so we have a couple of updates to hear, and um, I think we have Dawn here with us. I'm not sure if Neela has joined quite yet, but I think that's our first one to hear from is an update on the salmon indicator. So Dawn, if you're with us, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, I think. And uh, Neela, apologies if I'm missing your name here in our, in our meeting. Yeah, hi there. Um, I was not expecting to talk, and I was so I'm on my phone wandering around my house making lunch. Um, <laughs> to, but if you can hear me, I guess I can give you a quick update on the salmon, on the salmon indicator. Um, I'm Don Spilsbury Pucci. I'm with the Watershed Company, but I'm also the Salmonids Work Group Coordinator. Um, and Neela Kendall from Fish and Wildlife is the indicator lead for the sam salmon indicators. Um, and she presented to our work group on Friday. And so, um, so as soon as you guys see Neela come online, they'll cut me off and get her on because uh, she knows way more about this. I can only retell you what she told us on Friday. Um, we have four, so the, traditionally the um, indicator has been for Chinook and it's natural spawner abundance. Um, so we're only looking for the wild fish that are naturally spawning um, and the abundance of that. And um, now we have added steelhead and hood canal summer chum and coho to that. And the indicators being naturally, um, natural origin, natural spawners as well, abundance on that. Uh, steelhead and coho, she's made some, uh, pardon me, steelhead and hood canal summer chum, she's made some progress on. Um, they use the data that is collected by the co-managers. It's the same data that NOAA uses for their five-year status reviews for those species since they are all listed. Um, we just calculate them or we uh, handle that uh, slightly differently. Um, and that's the same information that goes into the state of the salmon. Um, we, Neela then compares it to targets. Uh, Chinook was just set by the Leadership Council um, and then the steelhead and the chum um, goals, we'll have to ask uh, Neela what targets those are. I believe they're the ones set by NOAA. Uh, and then we look for um, progress. So whether they're increasing or decreasing and, um, and how they're getting towards these goals. Coho has been a bigger challenge in that because they are not a listed species. Um, they are also uh, often the abundance is tied to, abundance calculations are tied to hatchery. So um, production, so that makes it a little bit more complicated. We're also talking about, so we're struggling a little bit with how to communicate progress for um, um, the species when there, ha when there is no goal or target, I should say, set, because they are not listed. So um, those, so we're thinking about doing an abundance trend for them 
this year until we get in a target set and then we can then we can classify the progress whether they're declining no progress or increasing um i think that's is that good is that what the kind of information you're looking for, <laughs> for from us yeah don i appreciate you uh jumping in and sharing the update on on eli's behalf and stuff too so Thanks so much. I think uh, we're we're going to see if Neela can join a little bit later, but okay. otherwise we'll just we'll just move on at this point. Unless anyone has any questions uh, for Don or that we could track and then pass along to Neela later too. So I'll pause for just a moment, or feel free to drop that in the chat too. I'll just note, hi everybody. This is Mary Ramirez, and with the partnership of working on the vital signs reporting, um, that was a great summary, Don. I'll just note that the um, the indicators right now, the new ones, um, do not have reports on our Vital Signs webpage at this time, but we're expecting those fairly soon, um, and uh, as well as an update to the Chinook salmon indicator. And when those are updated, I'll be sure to um, let this work group know so that you can check those reports out. Wonderful, thank you. So I think we also wanted to give an opportunity to you, Brad Hansen, if, if you're online too, and, and wanna share a little bit of what's going on on your side of things. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um... Well, we um, had a couple of field efforts over the last um, few months and summer. We had a um, <clears throat> three-week effort um, out at the west entrance state of, straight of Juan de Fuca uh, looking for southern resident killer whales, um, primarily out around the Swiftshire Bank area. Um, we did encounter whales on a couple of occasions uh, and were able to collect uh, some fecal and <clears throat> prey samples during that uh, that particular effort, and with uh, the goal to try to get some additional information in these uh, shoulder seasons, if you will. DFO has been working out there primarily during the summer months, and we're just trying to work through some of these other seasons. Uh, we did have a <clears throat> three-week uh, field effort in September, working with uh, Joe Gatos from the Sea Doc Society, as well as Hendrick Nolans from San Diego Zoological Alliance. And the focus of that work uh, is on health assessment. And so we did have Southern residents for a couple of days, but um, uh, as has been the case in, the, in recent years, they haven't been in as much as we'd like them to be, but we, we were successful in collecting uh, some samples that uh, that Joe and Hendrick are processing. Um, and uh, we're continuing to uh, analyze data from our DTAG study. Uh, Marla has been working on that. And Jenny Tennyson, who was a postdoc with us, has uh, transitioned to the University of Washington now, uh, but is continuing to be supported through by DFO for that, for that sort of work. And uh, <clears throat> we are also uh, continuing to uh, deploy acoustic recorders on the outer coast. Uh, we did that in July of this uh, last year. And then in the fall, we deployed a couple of acoustic recorders in the main basin of Puget Sound um, for this winter period. And primarily we're trying to target the uh, quiet sound period. So, um, that uh, is some of the primary things we've, we've been up to. I'll just leave it at that to try to keep things short. Thanks so much. Uh, any questions for Brad? I'm not seeing any hands raised, but Scott, I saw you unmute yourself. So I want to give you a chance to ask a question if you had one. Yeah, I guess I. Since since uh, maybe we'll invite Neela back, I, you know, I attended one of the Salmonid workgroup meetings where they discussed the revision of the Salmonid um, indicators. So I, I just wanted to contextualize this section since um, with a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is the the PSEMP um, webpage is is really sitting at the Puget Sound Partnership. For those of you who are new 
to these calls. Um, this marine mammals work group document is, is the sort of the homepage for our work group. But you'll notice there's all these other work groups, including the Salmonids work group. Um, so that's that's one thing I wanted to point out is that's where you can find information about these other work groups. So that's so this is Dawn and um, and so the other thing that Natalie could do a much better job of is just contextualizing this conversation around the vital signs. Um, the, the salmon vital sign you'll see used to just be Chinook salmon, natural origin, and now has um, higher granularity, let's say, um, both being specific about the species, but also um, I think also like hood canal, like subregions. Um, so I guess that's a question for you, Don, is, is the summer chum specific to hood canal or does it integrate um, information from the main basin as well? Um, no, it's the summer chum because they're the listed species. Not all chum are listed. So the population of the summer spawning chum that are generally in um, Hood Canal and the Straits. So uh, the, there's kind of two, two populations that are going to have a progress um, um, decision attached to them. And so there's the Hood Canal summer chum and the um, Straits spawning population, summer spawning population of chum. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, and just for everybody else, like I, I've been trying to understand better the nature of these data. And so this is an example of, this is you know what we'll expect for those other indicators is something like this, Don? Well, yeah, so the, the population of Chinook has, um, there's 22 populations of Chinook, Puget Sound Chinook salmon. Um, there, I don't, they, I don't, remember and also Mary's here and Mary is just as um, versed on all of this as um, Natalie so um, Mary correct me if I'm misstepping anything but so Chinook there's several populations probably not all 22 um, but they're broken into whether they're increasing decreasing in their confidence interval and that's all but again we're not looking at wild or pardon me hatchery we're only looking trying to tease out the wild populations um, Steelhead is got less popular, has fewer populations that are monitored. What we're limited by is what populations are actually being monitored and broken out by, and where the data is broken out by hatchery um, and wild. And uh, so not all rivers where steelhead are found are monitored for steelhead and not all, mon you know, and vice versa for all the species. Chinook are pretty good, um, pretty broadly monitored. So that's the so that's kind of what the data is going to look like. Coho is again different. We're still going to figure that out. So, but yeah, there's going to be the two populations of chum, the I think six of steelhead, and the about sixteen I believe or thereabouts of the chinook. Great, thank you. I just I think this will help motivate some of the the workshops um, this winter. But the other th shout out I wanted to what's gotten me thinking about this again is the movements of the Southern residents. So I just wanted to show an example of the amazing data density that Orca Network and Melissa has been leading this charge of trying to share what's historically only been available on Facebook. Um, so these are mostly paths of Southern residents and really interesting to watch the pods like KPOD go around Vashon while JPOD goes up and checks the Skagit and Snohomish deltas. And so, I feel like the, the resolution of the opportunistic sightings is starting to help us understand and contextualize the predator-prey interactions in, in, in a way that presents opportunities. Um, so, so, so Scott, can I clarify, are you um, then, so when you're comparing, when you're asking about salmon, the salmon, the way the indicators are for salmon and then looking at this, are you hoping that in some way you can kind of further refine the popular, the, the groups within the the marine mammals and by region and calculating them that way. Well, we're we're this is the begin the early stages of thinking about how we would compute occupancy metrics for both bigs and southern resident ecotypes, and and so I'm interested in understanding what in what subregions of Puget Sound and the Salish Sea we have uh, information about the salmonids in the marine environment. And also, I think we should go back and 
look with Casey's help, hopefully, at the subregions we've used to characterize the pinniped and harbor porpoise populations. Um, so that's okay. that's the motivation is trying to understand the prey distributions at the same time we're looking for you know, deriving meaningful occupancy metrics. Then yeah, then you're going to want to talk to Neela about what kind of um, marine sampling that they do. Not as, you know our indicators are you know we're looking at what's on the spawning ground up river and it's only for certain populations. It's not going to give you a full view of what's in the sound ready to be eaten at any given time. I don't think. Okay, so I guess that's the last question. I mean, I, we're, we're going to run out of time. I guess we are out of time, but there's an implicit question in there for you, Brad, which is, you know, are, are you sampling a high enough? I mean, obviously you can't be with both pods when they split, but do you think we're starting to resolve the uh, prey that the Southern residents are targeting? So Scott, sorry to interject here. Um, this is really timely and we wanna not lose this thread, but just with how packed our agenda is right now, I think we wanna take note of this and return to it if we have some time at the end or uh, at some future discussions. And this is actually a great segue, I think to some of the uh, next topic here too about the work occupancy indicator and what that process is going to look like. So I'll segue here, but let's not lose this because this is good stuff. Super, um, thank you. Yeah, thanks Scott. So the, the update that I have for you all, and some of this will be interactive too, I wanna to have some discussion around this piece, but um, for those of you that have been involved with this group for a long time, you'll recall that there is this new ORCA occupancy indicator that um, we're tasked with developing and our coordinating team, we're gonna be supporting you all and supporting that effort as well. Um, I wanna give you a heads up of what that process is going to look like in the coming months. Uh, we're not gonna get really into the details of it today. Um, but really just want to start too by acknowledging, you know, this is the this is the Marine Mammals Work Group and uh, we've been getting familiarized with some of the context of discussion that's already been had and some feedback that's been shared on some of the intention around this indicator. So just know that context isn't lost on us, but we are embarking on this new process to go ahead and start to scope for this new indicator, get that developed, and we're excited to partner with you all on that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here in just a moment and then also invite you all to join the link that Nicole dropped into the chat if you're with us today on the computer. Um, and would love to get some ideas from you all that will help guide uh, an intended workshop that we're planning for uh, January, so early 2023. Um, and we wanna think about some of the, the guiding questions that we'll be um, putting together for this workshop, who we really wanna be inviting to this conversation and things we wanna be thoughtful about. So give me one moment here, I will share my screen. And just want to give you an orientation to the tool that we'll be using for two pieces of our discussion. Okay. So I see some of you have already clicked on the link. You're already starting to get in there, and that's great. Um, before you start really interacting with the pieces, this is called Mural. Uh, it's an online collaboration tool. It's essentially like a, a whiteboard on the computer. Uh, we've organized a few major sections in this, so there's a lot of information already on this virtual whiteboard. Uh, just a couple of navigational pieces and how to interact with this. Um, to move around the board, you can click your mouse down and then drag it, and it should be pretty intuitive with how to, how to move yourself around. Sometimes you may accidentally click and drag a box or click and drag an element. Don't worry about it. Our team will help put that back in place. Uh, to zoom in, and you can zoom in or out to whatever your heart's desire is. Um, you can either click the box in the lower corner, and I'll see if I can highlight this for you. Looks like that tool is not working for me, but in the lower right corner, there is a zoom in and zoom out tool. And you can also click on various areas of the whiteboard itself to jump to that section. Uh, if you have a mouse, you can just scroll in like I do, and you like scroll up or down, and that will do your automatic zoom for you. The other piece is uh, some of this will be interactive for adding in your comments. To, to add a comment to any of the boxes, you just double click, and then you can start typing. There's a test for you. That's my quick orientation. I mentioned that there's a, a few different sections of this. What I want us to focus on right now is on the far left side of the mural board. It's the number one work occupancy indicator workshop planning. So that's over here with the blue, purple, and yellow boxes. So 
if you could all join me here and Nicole, since you're the host of this board, if you could do the nifty summon me here, uh, that would be helpful. And for those of you you'll, that are in here, you'll see that that drags you to the same screen that I'm looking at. So I'm gonna stop share for now and that way we can see each other's faces, but I'll continue to narrate and um, walk us through this exercise together. So I mentioned we, we just wanna do some early planning for this workshop and we're gonna have lots of opportunity to really dig into the details of what this occupancy indicator can look like. Um, but the first question that I wanna to pose to you all is thinking about who we wanna make sure is in the room or in the virtual room for this. And apologies if I blind you on my screen, I have some backlight that might light up every now and then. So if you could join me on the blue boxes, uh, <clears throat> And if you could help brainstorm anyone outside of our marine mammal circle that's already been a part of this uh, planning process so far who you think would have valuable insight. Um, maybe they're working in relevant programs uh, in, in Canada as well. We don't necessarily need to say it's specific to Puget Sound here. And I know we already have some partners that are up in, in Canada as well. So please go ahead and, and drop some, some thoughts there. If you're not in the mural board with us, please feel free to just unmute yourself, share some ideas verbally, um, drop ideas in the chat too, if that's more your jam today. So lots of lots of ways to share ideas, but I see some of you are already starting to add some thoughts in there. So that's great. I see a policy lead at Fish and Wildlife. Um, see some other ideas getting dropped in there. So that's good. I'd also like to invite you to think about members of other work groups, the other PSAMP work groups that may have relevant perspectives to contribute to the development of this indicator. And I'm, I'm realizing too, I may have moved quite quickly through this indicator. Remind me, Gretchen or Scott, did I give the quick orientation of exactly what this indicator is? I think that's vital for lack of a better word. It's a bit of a pun here in this context, I think. <laughs> yeah, you provided a bit of context, but feel free if anybody has questions uh, to unmute yourself and, and ask Corey if you need a little more context before providing the input that she's soliciting right now. Thanks. And yeah, so I'll just reiterate that this indicator is for uh, the number of days that both Southern resident and Biggs killer whales are within Puget Sound or observed within Puget Sound in a given year. So feel free to keep interacting with this question. You can bounce around as ideas come to you. Um, I'll ask you to move over to the purple or the lavender colored squares. And this one is we want to just solicit some initial ideas and brainstorm for any data sources or programs that you think are relevant to developing this indicator. I've already added in a few that we've been tracking from previous conversations that have been had, but if there's anything else on top of these few, um, or maybe it's a, um, a piece of what you know about that's within Whale Museum or within the Orca Network, uh, feel free to please differentiate that as well. And as Corey mentioned, if Mural isn't working for you for whatever reason, we can help you offline uh, for the next meeting because we do envision using this tool quite a bit moving forward as an interactive um, way to collaborate online. Uh, so let us know in the chat. You can either, either personally let me know in this direct message or, or to the group. And we can also put the questions that Corey is asking you in the chat so you can provide responses via Zoom chat as well. Thanks, Gretchen. That's perfect. And thanks, everyone. I see you already starting to add a couple of thoughts, a couple of ideas in there. So I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the next one, too. And remember, you can return back to these questions at any point in this discussion. But our last question is, what should we be thoughtful about when we're developing this indicator? And some of this is reflecting on some of the context that we've heard for um, the history of arriving at the, the need for developing this indicator, but what might we want to consider as we start this initial scoping process and um, activity piece? Nicole, just a note, I think we're all summoned back to the upper portions, if you wouldn't mind summoning us to the lower. Thank you. Perfect. Did that not work? Nope, that worked perfectly okay. this time. Thank you. Thank you.
Awesome, seeing some ideas already, geography, seeing some others that are coming back to the previous questions, adding some thoughts there. Wonderful. I'll give everyone another couple of minutes to keep adding some thoughts and we'll keep this open too throughout the rest of this meeting and uh, likely even afterwards as well. So if you wanna to return to it, add some ideas, we'll be able to see that. And this helps us start to plan for the workshops as well. Tribal input, data sources, this is great, thank you. And just to echo that, Corey, we'll definitely keep this open. And because some folks had to jump off early or weren't able to join today, we'll be sharing this link um, later this week, I think, and keep it open through the end of the year. Great. Thanks, everyone. Just, a, just another couple of seconds here and then we'll move on to the next piece of our agenda. So don't wanna, don't wanna stop you too soon. I see some good ideas being added in here. Okay. Oops. All right, well with that, Nicole, I'll pass it over to you and I think we'll move on to the, the next piece of our agenda. Sounds good, thanks, Corey. All right, so the next agenda item is this 2023 visioning. And what we're gonna do, you'll see I'll summon, I didn't actually know how to summon, so this is a fun new tool, Corey, thank you. <laughs> um, but this is was pulled from the 2022 Marine Mammal Work Group Objectives Work Plan. And what we wanted to do for the first couple minutes is just reflect on what has been completed, what will be ongoing into the 2023 work plan and potentially a suggestion to remove. Um, and you can do that by dragging, and maybe I can share my screen actually. So this is what it looks like and you can do that by dragging these little check marks and that will just let us see kind of where we're landing on these um, work group objectives. Just one additional kind of point of context recognizing many of you were part of the 2022 work plan development, but not everybody, we have a few new faces here. So these all come from the work plan document that was developed by this group um, for 2022 focus areas. I can't do it at the same time. I move check marks around, but I could um, read a quick synopsis of uh, the progress that I've seen on those on those points. Would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be great, Scott. Um, so, and it's a good way to give a shout out, some shout outs to some folks who are on the call. Um, we did have three submissions to the 2021 Marine Waters Report. Um, one was Cindy's contribution of some information about harbor seal aggregations. Another was um, uh, Joe, Joe's synopsis of the both birds and uh, harbor porpoise survey results from a, the winter overflight. Uh, history. So that's that's exciting to have an update of that. And then um, Emily Veerling provided a summary of those acoustic detections of humpbacks we were talking about earlier. It was very preliminary, but there is a, a page starting to track that phenomenon. Um, I, Brad, Brad can probably speak, or if Lynn's back, um, or maybe not to Lee on the indicator report, but I think we checked that box. Uh, without any issues. Yeah, that indicator was was updated this year, um, but it's, you know, it, it it's an annual mm -hmm. update for us. So we'll do it again in 2023. And thanks to your the workshops that we're gonna have more structure than I imagined um, when we put in the, you know, begin discussing methodologies, but we have 
we have committees with um, separate listservs ready to, to provide information and feedback. Um, so those were established this year. And this meeting itself is, is in part an attempt to start discussing the occupancy methodologies. Um, I hope we can hear in the winter in the workshops from Monica, who's published on occupancy metrics for bigs. Um, but there may be other ideas and approaches that we could all benefit from discussing. So I, I, I think we've started checking that, but maybe we should leave it unchecked and make sure we check it in 2023. Um, uh, and it sounded like you created these updates and profiles. Uh, we fell a little short the, than of where we thought we would get. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's an ongoing effort um, to work on the humpback and harbor seals, but I, I don't think I'd say that's probably ongoing into 2023, but uh, Stephanie, who couldn't make the call, she deserves a shout out for generating a, a nice contribution to the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound about the lone beluga that visited um, Puget Sound. Um, so that was a contribution of a, of a brief in the in encyclopedia, mm -hmm. which is the next one down. Mm -hmm. So you were able to produce one to two new briefs, and that's something we'll continue into 2023 as well. And then, Scott, you already talked about this a bit, but um, interacting with other work groups. Yeah, I'll just say that, um... Yeah, I'm excited to interact more with the Salmonids. I think that that work group and the forage fish work group are going to be the most exciting for us to compare notes with. Um, the spatial data group, I've been watching their lists, their their emails, and they're mostly focused on um, habitat, like shoreline spatial data. So it's uh, somewhat related to us, but not as much as I, I think it will be later. Uh, and the modeling work group, I'm, I'm having a little terrible tracking, but they are uh, definitely spinning back up compared to the previous decade. Um, and uh, I'm a little behind on understanding exactly where uh, Tess Francis is heading, but um, the work group is definitely much more active than it was a year ago. Great. And if anyone has any notes, you can also, um, Create sticky notes by double clicking. We'll move on to this visioning portion for 2023. And obviously we'll, we'll be taking a lot of these previously identified objectives into 2023, but wanted to flag a couple additional goals um, that have a lot of you know, subtasks under it, but these are the main deliverables. Um, so finalizing updates of the vital sign key messages, that's an annual objective, develop an action plan for developing the ORCA occupancy vital sign indicator, that's the work Corey will be leading, the activity we just participated in, and then we also identified it, um, that we'll be supporting the development of the noise in marine water vital sign indicator, so Erin um, we'll be coming to the work group in the winter and looking for, I think, additional feedback and um, we'll be communicating and sharing products and assist in pro promoting the products to relevant audiences. And uh, this is really, um, you know, what the coordinating leads are tasked with drafting and coordinating, and then we'll be looking to this work group for vetting and participation in the final deliverable, of course. And then in this, um, there's a couple stickies. Is there anything else? Noting we will be carrying over some of these elements that you're working on that should be captured in the 2023 work plan that you spoke on previously in 2022 that isn't captured in these two tables that you would want to flag as we continue to work on the work plan. And Nicole, just a couple of things I wanted to flag in the chat. Um, there oh, was yeah. one comment uh, just in terms of work that's in our contract that may or may not be captured here as part of the work plan. Is there anything 
in our contract that isn't captured here in terms of what we've been tasked with that would be relevant to the this particular work group and any additional work. I have a thought there, Gretchen, that I can probably offer and Nicole, feel free to jump in too. But for example, um, Natalie, before she dropped off, she mentioned that our group is here to help with some drafting. Uh, we can really help support some of the, the back end work that you all have been, to Francis, your point, voluntarily leading on your own up to this point too. So I'd say that that's one big piece um, that we can support with. Uh, for, for many things. I think that there's probably, we'll have to talk about it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for example, some of the, the vital signs, key messages, which your group has uh, done yourselves in the past, we can help take lead on that, write some language, give you guys something to react to, work with you really collaboratively on that. So I would say, Gretchen, maybe that's not as specific as you had in mind, but that's one, one thing that I would offer that um, it is well within our scope to help support you all with. Great. Thanks for adding that, Corey. And then also just wanting to note a comment in the chat from Francis as well. With so many um, support staff for this group, now it might be more productive um, to have some of these tasks undertaken by those folk uh, with input from group uh, mm -hmm. member experts. So that gets to Corey's thing where we can take some, some things on, um, uh, provided that it aligns with what's in our contract. Uh, and then give you all things to react to. So yeah, that's a great suggestion there. I just wanted to capture that in the chat. Great. All right, and we have some additional work plan elements potentially coming in, increased connections across work groups. I think that's something we can call out and was also indicated in the 2022 work plan, make stronger tribal connections, promote open data access, increasing equity, an ORCA versus ancillary measure, self-resident killer whale fecundity. ORCA versus ancil ancillary me measure, self-resident killer whale body condition. So feel free to keep putting these in and the intention is um, we're going to synthesize this mural board and really make it into a, a draft work plan that we can get your input on. And with the next few minutes here, um, we have some questions, again, I think, um, to help us with being introduced to this group. It's our first meeting, and we want to get to know everyone better and see, you know, what you have seen as the most value from your participation in this group. And I'll just see if I can summon. So in the third and fourth section, these are questions that we would like your input on um, to help us understand what you'd like to see more of or less of in the coming year. And then in this fourth section about funding and collaboration, are there any funding opportunities outside of the PSP um, solicitation request for information that Scott mentioned earlier that the group would benefit from knowing about? And do you anticipate any opportunities for collaboration in the coming year? And that could be data sharing, pursuing funding opportunities, writing proposals, reporting or projects. So I wanna give you just a couple minutes to navigate the board, put in some answers here, and then we'll wrap up with next steps and kind of highlight the when our next meeting will be and kind of what January and February will look like. So I'll give you a few minutes here and stop sharing my screen. Just have some quiet working time or, you know, if there are any questions from earlier, the presentations that you weren't able to ask, we could take um, this time while people are working in here to also continue that discussion. And I don't think Neela was able to join. No, okay.
We're having some folks drop off. It is the end of the meeting. And this will be open. So I'll get on to next steps here in a moment. But thank you all. I see a lot of folks putting in some answers here. Really appreciate your participation. All right. Well, before we lose the critical mass, I'll I'll go into next steps. And feel free to keep working in the background on those questions. All right. So for meeting frequency, just want to flag that we're planning on, we have a tentative um, date range for the next meeting to be within February. Um, so we'll be sending out a doodle poll, uh, similar to how we set up this meeting, just uh, asking folks for their preferred dates and times and selecting the time that has the most overlapping availability. And it will probably be around mid-February for that. We also have some meetings coming up in relation to the ORCA occupancy vital sign indicator. So Corey, I don't know if you want to speak to those next steps. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we'll take the feedback that we heard from you all and ideas that you shared today. Um, but really the main next step is keep an eye out for an invite from us. And we may also send out um, a scheduling poll to make sure that we can get um, as much of your time as we can or find a date that works well for you and your schedules. So keep an eye out for that. And then we'll, we'll be sharing some more information uh, ahead of that. But right now the target timeline is late January. Great. And just as a reminder for folks on the call, we've been communicating through the Marine Mammal Work Group Listserv, and that's how we see communicating with this group. Um, but we'll take care to make sure maybe Neela wasn't on that listserv potentially. So we'll take care to, to definitely connect with folks that you've identified on the mural exercise and reach out to them as well. And Scott, you've pulled up some of the other communication tools. Yeah, maybe, maybe just as a refresher since you're the most familiar as I'm yeah. ramping up here. Yeah, sure. Just for the folks who haven't um, been on calls before, I, I mentioned the web page. There's also a shared Google Drive folder with um, where we sort of have been doing our, our work. So you're welcome to um, get access to that. And then I mentioned the spreadsheet of the species and topical committees. Um, I think we'll be using more, more of those distribution lists beyond the general ones. So that spreadsheet does have links to the, the other listservs I've been trying to set up for each, each uh, committee. So feel free to join those or um, take a leadership role in any of, in any of those committees. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. I haven't really been populating it very much, but that's an initial effort to try to increase the communication channels that we're, we're using to share what we learn. Great, thanks, Scott. And for if you're really geeky and you want to <laughs> uh, look at data cooperatives and software to move beyond annual updates towards where I think we could go, which is you know monitoring Puget Sound in real time or on monthly basis instead of getting like the Marine Waters Group does. Uh, to understand the oceanographic variability that happens. Uh, I think we can get there. And this is one place where we could work with our Canadian colleagues on software, open software development. Great, thanks. And we got a chat from Francis Robertson about a future agenda item. And if um, any of the other members have future agenda item recommendations, we'll definitely take note of that and track it. So. I hear that, Francis, and we'll note it. I'll be um, distributing a meeting summary from today. We also have a recording that will be shared, I think, on the YouTube channel, Scott. Yes. And so this will be able to be watched for members who weren't able to join today or had to jump off early. And Thanks. the 
uh, mural board activity will also remain open. And Super. So I'll, I'll add a link to that YouTube channel. So thanks okay. for. <laughs> it's also uh, each each recording is linked on that that main homepage as well. Great. All right, and any other um, future agenda items, please feel free to send them our way and be prepared for some doodle polls to come your way for scheduling out the January workshops and our next quarterly meeting. And with that, I think we'll adjourn. And thank everyone for joining us today. These two hours went by super fast. It was great meeting you all. Really appreciate your help. Thank you all three for coordinating with us. First, thanks everyone. So nice to so nice to meet you. Thanks all.